Yeah. Okay, Cam, we're, uh, Cam and Dennis, we're live. Everything seems to be working fine. I tweeted it out, I Facebooked it out. And let's get rid of the funky music. All oh, perfect timing. The song is just ending. Okay, welcome, Dennis. Uh, last time, uh, what, what, let's see, we did a live stream with you, was it a month ago? I think so. Yeah, and I uh, really enjoyed that. And so we're having you back on. Uh, I've titled this uh, Jesus Did Exist, The Synoptic Problem and Q. And so we're going to talk about all those things and probably more. But for some of you listening, um, you might not know who Dennis is. So I'm just going to read off some sentences here on uh, Wikipedia. And Dennis, you can tell me if it's right or wrong. But you're a John Wesley professor. What does that mean? Um, there was an endowed professorship that had just a pittance of money in it to have a New Testament professor um, who was genial to the um, Wesleyan tradition. So it was a position that um, some uh, Burton Mack and other people have had, and uh, I was hired to into that slot. I see. Okay. Uh, you're a full professor of New Testament and Christian origins at Claremont School of Theology in California. Um, you propose a theory wherein the earliest books of the New Testament were responses to the Homeric epics, including the Gospel of Mark and the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Your background, you have an undergraduate degree from Bob Jones University. That's a very conservative Christian university, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a Master's of Divinity from McCormick Theological Seminary. That's right. And uh, the money shot is a PhD from Harvard University. Yep. Uh, you've taught theology and biblical studies at ILIF, ILIF? ILIF, uh huh. School of Theology in Denver, and what else? And yeah, you know, right now you're at Claremont. Anything else we should add to that? No, that's enough. You just recently got married, correct? I did, yeah, just over two months ago. Is the honeymoon over? Uh, well, we haven't had the honeymoon yet. We're going to Greece this summer. Ah, so, excellent. Well, make sure to go to Antioch. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to basically um, be fairly quiet throughout all this, and Cam is going to take the lead and ask you questions. If there's anything you need, any illustrations, anything you want me to pop on the screen, just let me know. I will... Uh, be more vigilant in the chat this time. So if anybody has questions, feel free to ask anything you want, even if you think it's too simple or um, if you're not understanding something, because the goal here is to educate. And uh, we'll probably try to answer all those questions at the at the end. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So Cam, take okay, it away. Thanks, Doug. Thanks. Excellent. Well, welcome, Dennis. I'm so glad to have you here today. Um, I thought that our first interview was a great introduction to some of your other work, but it turns out you're also um, a very prominent author um, on the synoptic problem, um, having proposed a novel solution um, to it and uh, backed by some very interesting research. Um, so for our listeners, uh, they may not know what the synoptic problem is. So I'd love you to just give an overview of uh, what this problem with the Gospels is and uh, maybe some proposed solutions to it. And yeah. That's a great place to start. The synoptic Gospels are the first Gospels that appear in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's clear that there is a literary connection among them, but there have been a number of vying proposals, and there still is what I call the synoptic war that is raging. And it's raging on two fronts. One front is what does one do with Matthew-Luke agreements against each other when they're not dependent on Mark? Mark is generally recognized to be the earliest gospel and was used independently by Matthew and Luke. But Matthew and Luke also have overlapping content with each other against Mark that requires some accounting. One possibility is that Matthew and Luke independently know another document. 
And one of the major reasons for that is that Matthew and Luke both have doublets of content that appears. One example comes from the Gospel of Mark. The other comes from someplace else. So a doublet, is that's where you have a, a story um, that is, you have two versions of it. Is that right? It's usually a saying. A saying, okay. So, for example, Matthew has two sayings on divorce, one of which clearly comes from Mark, and another one comes from somewhere else. And when you have the so-called non-Markan version of it, it's always more primitive than what we find in Mark. We also have examples of non-doublets. This is more difficult to understand, but where the author is redacting or editing Mark, and get, you get to a certain place and the author stops redacting Mark. But elsewhere in the gospel, you have a more primitive version of it. And it's likely that the author just didn't want to repeat something that had already been there. So this is one of the strongest arguments in favor of the what's so-called two document hypothesis. The two document mm -hmm. hypothesis is that Matthew and Luke use two documents as sources. One is Mark and the other is a lost gospel, often called Q from the German word Kavella, which is a word for source. It's likely that if there was a, a lost gospel, and I'm convinced there was, it went by the title, the Logoi of Jesus, or the words of Jesus. And, and so this hypothesis, this uh, two document or two source hypothesis, would you say that was the consensus position in the field currently? Uh, no, I don't think there's a consensus, but I would say it's the most dominant one. It's the default position. Right. Second, and, yeah. and it's because of that probably taught quite a lot in New Testament studies to undergraduates. Yes, it usually is taught that there was such a lost gospel, but it's difficult to reconstruct. And so it, it's, it's become something in some cases a, more of a cipher than a real document. Mm. Um, even though many people have tried to reconstruct it, and I think they can do it with a certain level of plausibility, but we'll see there are problems with that. The other challenge to the two-document hypothesis is called the Farrer hypothesis because it was pioneered by someone named Austin Farrer. It's sometimes called Mark and Priority without Q. And it argues that the overlapping content between Luke and Matthew is better accounted for by simply saying Luke redacted Matthew and took lots of liberties with it. And if one views, um, if in according to that position, Luke's sources are Mark and not Q, but Matthew. Right. So one can dispense with Q altogether. The and the advantages this... of that position are two. One, it allows for one to understand why you have some what are called minor agreements, but there are hundreds of them between Matthew and Luke that suggest that Luke knows how Matthew has redacted Mark. The other is we have examples of overlapping content in let's say the infancy narratives or the passion narratives of Matthew and Luke that fall outside of what we'd expect in a saying source. So um, the standoff there's a standoff between the two. The far hypothesis has to really struggle, though, to explain how it is that Luke so frequently preserves content that's more primitive than in Matthew. That is, one would think that if Luke is using Matthew and that accounts for this overlapping content, that in every case, Luke would be secondary. But in many, many examples, uh, Luke is primary. So how does right. one account for that? So that's where the stalemate is. And I, I know that uh, Mark Goodacre is now a prominent voice in this discussion, right. in particular arguing for the Farah hypothesis right. that 
Luke uh, redacts Matthew, and that that is sufficient to explain um, the synoptic problem with Mark and priority. And he um, notices this phenomena that he dubs editorial fatigue, uh, which he um, claims exists both in um, Matthew when Matthew redacts Mark, but also is apparent when Luke is on this hypothesis is redacting Matthew. Um, would you say that that uh, observation or that data is sufficient to establish um, dependence on Matthew by Luke? In some cases, it's um, very helpful. And I have um, great respect for Mark Goodacre and what he's accomplishing. I, I have two problems with it. One is it still cannot explain in many cases why Luke's content is more primitive than Matthew. So then one kind of looks into the grab bag of oral tradition to say that Luke simply knows oral traditions that are more primitive than what one has in Matthew. But in my own position, which I'd like to get to soon, I think Luke does know Matthew. And then in some of the cases, the arguments for um, editorial fatigue are good ones. So right. my, my position is, I would like to call it an armistice on that part of the synoptic war. I mentioned there were two wars. The other war is among advocates of Q, having, that the question is, did Mark know the Q document as well as Matthew and Luke? And my view is that Mark must have known the Q document, in which case, you can't reconstruct Q simply by eliminating Mark and influence. Right. He has to calculate Mark and Papius of Heriopolis, who wrote the expositions of Logi about the Lord, as potential witnesses to Q. What that means is that the criteria become rather arcane and, and uh, complex. So before launching into your um, proposed solution, uh, I'd like to just recap um, to make sure everybody's on the same page. So we have material shared between Mark, Matthew, and Luke, which we call the triple tradition. Okay. We have material that's shared between Matthew and Luke, I mean, with differences, but material shared there, which is not present in Mark, which we call the double tradition, and that has been the large motivation for people hypothesizing another source. And we have some uh, relationships between um, the, the texts that don't appear to be straightforwardly explained by um, Luke alone redacting Matthew. And so we are doubly motivated to hypothesize another document. Yes, that's very well put. So, so with that in mind, um, we maybe you could tell me a little bit about who Papius was and the role that um, uh, his work um, plays in your theory. Papius was a bishop in Hierapolis, Phrygia, that is Central Asia Minor. And he composed a book called Expositions of Logia about the Lord around the year 110. He seems to have been not a Pauline Christian, but more of a Johannine Christian. And in fact, he relies on John the Elder, who may, who probably was the author of the Johannine epistles for information about three earlier gospels. Now, Papias's work was five volumes, and it was so extensive that Jerome in the fourth century decided he wouldn't even attempt a Latin translation of it. So it must have been exhaustive. Wow. And copies of it were still available in Greek in the fourth century and in Armenian probably until about the 13th century. Um, and it was, a, it was an enormous text as far as we know, but only fragments of it survive. 
So one of the curiosities is why would such a, a valuable document not survive? But what's most important for the synoptic problem is that John the Elder and Papias are writing before the Gospel of Luke, before the Gospel of John, but they know three Gospels. One Gospel is Mark that Papias attributes to the transcription of the preaching of Peter. And so do we have confidence that the Mark that Papias identifies is the same gospel attributed to Mark we have today? Well, I think that's the simplest solution. And unless we had evidence to the contrary, I think we should trust it. But even more important is what he says about Matthew. He argues that Matthew wrote a Hebrew gospel. Almost no one today thinks that there was a Hebrew original Matthew. Right. Uh, he has two translations, at least two, uh, into Greek, both of which are problematic. And the three Gospels that he has have these logia or these pericope or these stories and, and sayings in different sequences. So Papias says that he wants to put them back into the, the right order and he wants to embellish them with interpretations and oral traditions that he knows that are going about. One of those Matthews that is an alleged translation of the Hebrew Matthew is our Matthew, more or less. The other is lost. But it obviously would have had affinities with the Gospel of Matthew or Papias and the Elder wouldn't have identified them as defective translations of, of another text. And he also is quite clear that he does not like the Greek Matthew's understanding of the death of Judas, and he gives his own interpretation of the death of Judas. Hmm. Well, Judas doesn't even appear in the uh, the other gospel, in the lost gospel, apparently. So right. That is that for me is very valuable and underestimated external evidence of a lost gospel. In addition, Luke seems to have known Papias's work, and he begins his own work by talking about many poli uh, attempts to uh, narrate the events that have happened among us, is the way he talks about it. Two documents are not many. And the, the documents that I think he has in mind are the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, the Q document, and Papias' exposition. And four is many. And what as just as Papias wanted to put things into the correct order, Luke wants to put them into the correct order too, and to embellish them. And he embellishes them largely by imitating Homeric epic. But that's that that was what we talked about earlier. So I would like to stop there for a moment to consider. My understanding is that Papias claims that Mark, the the source of Mark is somehow Peter. Yes. Yet you and I both believe that Mark has extensively um, imitated both the Old Testament and um, the Homeric epics. Those two things for me don't seem to jive. Is Papias a reliable source? Um, he's reliable. That's a very insightful observation, Cam. He's reliable not in his solution to the synoptic problem he has. He's reliable, though, in articulating what the problem is, if I could put it that way. He has three Greek documents that have overlapping content, that differ from each other in the content and especially in the sequences of that content. So he then is trying to figure out how do I explain these differences? And the way he explains the differences in Mark is to say, well, Peter was just preaching. Mark wasn't interested in putting things in the sequence. Neither was Peter because he was simply preaching and memory. You know, recording what he had, had said. And so Mark put a few things together in as needed. 
right? And he didn't get the sequence right. Matthew, though, wrote his own gospel and got the sequence right. Unfortunately, the two translators got it wrong and they put things in a different sequence. So your question is right on target. His solution to the synoptic problem is wrong, and it's wrong for a number of reasons. And for that reason, scholars often have simply dismissed him as being not useful. But he is reliable in terms of the problem he's trying to solve. And I think there is an elegant alternative solution to that problem. So even though he's wrong about Mark getting things from Peter, he is right that he has a problem on his hands because you have three documents in Greek that are similar to each other, but deviate in sequence and sometimes substantially. I think we're almost ready to move on to um, the reconstruction of the the logoi of Jesus, but I just had a thought. Scholars have um, hypothesized a special M, a source behind the Mathean material that's both not present in Mark and not present in Luke. Now, some scholars think that is a, um, a literary source. Um, some scholars think that it is uh, oral, um, and some scholars have uh, even claimed that this material is purely Mathean invention um, using whatever compositional techniques we find common in the Gospels. What are your thoughts on the, the unique material um, in, in Matthew? Well, and one that's a very good question. Again, you're, you're highly educated in this game. Yeah, I'm really impressed. You could make the same issue about Luke. People talk about an L that informs the, the Luke narrative. And the question is similar. Is it oral tradition? Is it Luke composition and so on? But let's stay with Matthew. Very few scholars now, I think, hold to an M source because it's so easy to see in what Matthew has um, composed um, a distinctive theology and vocabulary and methodology, ecclesiology, it comes out of a late um, point in the development of the synoptic tradition. He now uses the word ecclesia for the church. There's more of a departure from traditional Judaism. There are concerns about the structure of the church and Peter's primacy and um, that Q, the M material is so easy to attribute to a creative author and redactor himself. And I think uh, Matthew gives us that impression himself. He says that the kingdom of God is like a householder, uh, uh, the scribe of the kingdom is like a householder who brings out of his house things that are old and things that are new. And I think the, the scribe is, the author is not just a scribe, the author is providing things that are old and new. So right. I think we've underestimated the authorial creativity of the Mathean evangelist. That's very, that's very interesting. <laughs> um, so in your, um, your book, Two Shipwreck Gospels, which for everyone in the audience is the primary work where you argue for and explore your hypothesis, um, you uh, attempt a reconstruction of the Logoi of Jesus or Q plus um, from the material common between uh, Matthew and Luke, much like we like traditional Q scholars would, but also using um, information we can um, infer, things we can infer from uh, what is preserved of uh, Papias. Mm -hmm. um, would you explore a little bit the methodology you use there and and a little bit about the final result and maybe what how it differs to traditional Q scholarship? Oh, that's a big order, Cam. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to make it as simple as I can and straightforward, but um, I'd like to think it's more sophisticated than we can talk about in YouTube. 
crucial to my understanding is the sequence of the composition of the Gospels, whether or not one identifies a relationship among them. That Mark is first, then Matthew, then Papias, then Luke, and then John. But uh, let's we can leave John out of the equation at this point. Just by one using one criterion, we can see the evidence of a lost gospel. It's a bit like scientists using um, various kinds of um, information to identify the influence of planets um, in from far away because you sense the gravitational influence of them. And that one criterion is what I call inverted priority. It goes like this. If one says that Matthew uses Mark, which is almost certain, why is it that Matthew frequently retains equivalents to Mark that are more primitive? That's inverted priority. One would think that Mark always would have priority unless there's some reason to talk about that Matthew has something that's more primitive. And so that happens could, over and over again. Or let me give another example. Let's say Luke. Luke is the last of the synoptics, even after Papias. But time after time, Luke has content that can be demonstrated to be earlier than his sources. It's more primitive either in wording or ideology or frequently in sequence. And so we we sense the radiation of a lost gospel when we find such examples of inverted priority. Now, it becomes messy because then one has to determine what accounts for what's primitive and what's secondary. And so that's why I don't want to go into all those criteria, but um, once one sees them, then one can see, I think, pretty clearly that Luke, though the, the late, latest of the Gospels to be composed, over and over and over again, preserves the most primitive traditions. And so you would say that, or would you say, that um, hypotheses about a redactional tendency of the author would not be sufficient to explain uh, these inverted priorities or these hypothesized inverted priorities? No, I don't think so at all. Um, and let me give you an example. I'm a, a firm believer, as you know, because you read some of my other things on Homeric imitation, that these authors are not simply passive tradents. They're not passively um, editing things they receive. They are real authors. And it's possible to say that in some cases, the author um, is, su is sufficiently sophisticated that you could craft something that looks to be more primitive, right? That, that would be the implication. But the places where we find this creativity are not places where we would identify typical Mathean or Lucan interests. That in right. some cases, they seem kind of rather foreign to what the author is trying to accomplish. So they so, don't fit the redactional profile that we've built up yes. through other examples. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Oh, that's 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 very interesting. So, what do you think the the lo logoi um, of Jesus consisted of broadly? Um, did it include narrative material or just sayings material? How close is it to uh, the traditional cue? Well, almost everything in, say, the critical edition of Q, which is the most widely reconstructed Q right now in scholarship, appears in Q+, because I think the criterion of Matthew-Luke overlaps is useful, even if Luke knows Matthew, because of inverted priority. But because of inverted priority, there are a number of things that appear in Q plus that don't appear in other Qs. That does not include an infancy narrative. It does not include a passion narrative. It does not include a resurrection narrative. 
It does not include very many miracle stories, certainly nothing like in Mark or the other Gospels, so walking on water or stilling the storm or the transfiguration. In fact, the text clearly is still a Jewish text. It doesn't show signs of a Pauline proclamation. Um, there's a prohibition of going to Gentiles, even though Gentiles are welcome to, to join the, the, the followers of Jesus. And it, it, it consists largely of controversies, a controversy about washing hands before eating, controversy for the Beelzebub controversy, for example. Um, uh, and so it has lots of controversies. Here is the best answer I can give to you, Cam. It's a Christianizing, but it's not yet a Christian document. It's still a Jewish document, rewriting of the book of Deuteronomy to portray Jesus as the prophet like Moses that was promised in Deuteronomy, but one who replaces the harshness of Pharisaic interpretations of Torah with one that is more compassionate so that Jesus frequently challenges Mosaic law and reinterprets it to make it more, uh, uh, more tolerable. Uh, for example, you have these uh, woes that appear in all versions of Q, including mine. You lay burdens on people, but you don't lift your finger to take them off. Yes, you should tithe the mint, the cumin, and so on but you're giving up issues of justice and love so that there is this um, new Moses criticism of Mosaic law by a radical Jew who is trying to humanize. Um, you know, and you can tell how excited I am about this. I really think it's a, it's a major breakthrough. And the author attributes that kind of generosity and compassion to Jesus himself related to a proclamation of the kingdom of God, that the rule of God is now come with, uh, with this new message. So it's, it, does, it has some narrative, but it doesn't have adventure stories. It doesn't have a life of Jesus, the same way that Deuteronomy has narratives in it. And many of the narratives in the Q document are these controversies over the law. So given that um, that it seems this author uh, has some creative um, tendencies using imitation or mim mimesis, much like, say, Mark does in the case of Odysseus, mm -hmm. How um, how close do you think this person's beliefs were to um, to like the original disciples? Um, well, he certainly presents the disciples as faithful heirs of the mission of Jesus, so that uh, Jesus sends them out two by two to be his emissaries, to, like him, preach the kingdom of God, like him, to um, uh, challenge demons and to heal the sick, like him, to go out in poverty and so on. If they re people receive them, they've received him and the one who sends him. So that there's a very positive attitude toward the 12 being successors to Jesus how close the content of the logo of Jesus is to Jesus's own proclamation is somewhat more problematic. And the way that I try to understand it is um, twofold. One is that there is a brilliant redefinition of the kingdom of God and God is king in this document that largely has to do with ethics and a reassessment of Mosaic law and what it means to be Jewish and what is acceptable um, content. The other is that we do have parallels between the content of Q and what we find in the epistle Paul, of Paul, the authentic epistles of Paul, what one might call multiple attestation. Unless one thinks that the logo of Jesus knew Paul, 
and wasn't fond of Paul's theology, or that Paul knew Q and radically transformed it, one would more likely say that both of them are tapping into traditional content that the, each side of this divide attribute to Jesus. And I think it would be an act of hubris to say that it doesn't come from Jesus unless there's good reason to. Um, many of these are wisdom sayings. Many of them are halakhic interpretations of Torah. Several of them deal with issues that we know are halakhic problems from uh, Qumran, for example. So um, I think there are ways of tapping into it. If I could put it another way, one should not see the logo of Jesus or Q, whatever reconstruction, simply as innocent repositories of Jesus's teachings without a certain amount of authorial creativity and indebtedness. That doesn't mean though that you can't mine that information. You just can't strip mine it. You can't take that information off the surface. You have to set up criteria for determining whether a certain saying could come from Jesus, whether it's coherent with other things we know, and most importantly for me, um, whether it coheres with a, um, a certain moral vision of the, the ruling of the, the, the kingdom of God. So about uh, authenticity criteria, many have been proposed. And as I understand it in your book, when you focus on the historical Jesus, you um, utilize uh, multiple attestation, uh, embarrassment, dissimilarity, is that correct? Yeah. And um, perhaps uh, perhaps another, and you could remind me, but what, what are your thoughts on the validity of those criteria as applied to the Gospels? Well, all criteria are going to be problematic. Um, let me start by answering in a different way. If one says that the author of the Logo of Jesus, or Q, is uh, interested in portraying Jesus as a prophet like Moses, that accounts for a lot of the information, and some of that, um, I doubt if Jesus considered himself the prophet like Moses, but it's not inconceivable. But we, So we can see in the Logo of Jesus this interest in and portraying Jesus in that way. But there's a lot of what I call adiaphora in, in um, the Logo of Jesus. That is information that isn't freighted um, with that agenda in mind. Where does the name Jesus come from? Why does he come from Nazareth? What's the name of his, why the name of his father is Joseph? Um, these are not significant. Why um, the number of um, 12 followers is certainly significant because of the 12 tribes of Judah and so on, or the Zodiac, if you want to go to in that direction. But the names of the apostles, of the disciples, seem to be relative reliable. We have the names that are elsewhere, and they're not freighted. There's no um, etymological significance to the names. And it's other kind of information like that, that I think is, is unfreighted, is kind of um, almost static to the story. And I don't see any reason to say that it's not reliable, especially since some of that information is consistent with what one finds in just the, uh, a few notes about Jesus and early Christians and Josephus, which are themselves problematic, and uh, Paul. So I think there is reason to say, some of my work has been used, as you know, Cam, to, uh, among, about, by Jesus mythicists, and it's related to Doug's opening comment, the re Jesus really existed. We have a synoptic problem, though, about how that information comes to us, and Q is one solution to that problem. So I think he encapsulated it pretty well. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that Jesus existed. I'm also sure that uh, I would trust the author of the Logo of Jesus in his attribution of a redefinition of the kingdom of God 
ethically and compassionately to Jesus, because one finds it also in Paul at, at certain points. I think it's consistent with one what I would say about the spectrum of Jewish speculations and interpretations of Torah. Um, but that the, the Q document, as you point out, has its own agenda. It's written in Greek. Um, it's rewriting Deuteronomy, and one has to take all of that seriously. So you can't strip mine Jesus lore off the top of the logo of Jesus, but you certainly can mine it. But mining it is is not as easy. That's very fascinating. I, I'd, I'd love to go deep in so many different directions there. <laughs> but um, one direction would be um, to ask about a figure like John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, does your reconstructed version of the uh, of Q plus include material about uh, Jesus's baptism? Yes, it does. It starts, in fact, here's, this is really amazing to me. The beginning words in the Septuagint of Deuteronomy are, these are the words that Jesus spoke in the wilderness to Egypt. The word Deuteronomy is in the Septuagint, probably the old Greek as well, but in Hebrew it was known as Hadabarim, the words. The likely title of the Logoi of Jesus was the words of Jesus, the same word that Logoi that appears at the beginning of Deuteronomy. But it's not Jesus who is in the wilderness preaching, it's John the Baptist who's in the wilderness preaching. And then he has to preach that one is going to come who is stronger than he. He's the promised one, that is, the prophet like Moses. And uh, so John the Baptist is very important. You mentioned earlier the criterion of dissimilarity and also of embarrassment. It's unlikely the author would have, in, have created a John the Baptist in order to show that Jesus is better than John the Baptist, right? And we have um, a good evidence in Josephus for the existence of John the Baptist. So this is one place where we would get multiple attestation between Logoi and, um, and Josephus, even if one says the rest of the information by John the Baptist and the Synoptics and the Gospel of John um, is, is coming from imitation. It isn't for the Logoi of Jesus. There's a tradition there that the author is struggling with. So to to pose an alternate hypothesis, and I, I'm not sure if I'll get this to its to its most concise extent, but if we assume for the moment that John the Baptist did exist, which I mean, some claim that the Mandean sects still today um, derive from uh, John the Baptist cult. Yeah. Um, if we assume that for the moment, and we also posit that it was uh, popular and at least had significant status or following, would it not be useful for an emerging document to have its founder uh, recommend Jesus to the people to um, attach his status and say that uh, Jesus's status is even higher, w wouldn't that be a, um, a, a useful thing to put on the lips of John the Baptist? Oh, it would, and it definitely would. So that, what that would say, if one wanted to go that direction, Cam, one could say there was a John the Baptist. John the Baptist had followers and was uh, successful. And the author of the Logoi of Jesus forces a connection between John the Baptist and Jesus in order to give credence to Jesus. I think you actually can take that a little further. John the Baptist, um, there's a passage in the Q document, whether you take my reconstruction or not, that says, uh, to what will I compare this generation? It's like children in a marketplace who say, we fluted for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a dirge for you, but you didn't mourn. For John came 
neither eating nor drinking, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and you say that he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In other words, both men are at opposite ends of acceptable behavior for the generation. One is an ascetic, the other is a party animal, as some have called him, and but wisdom is justified by both of these children. So according to what you're proposing, one could say that the author of the Logoi of Jesus or the Q document is interested in harmonizing John the Baptist and Jesus in order to um, and, and justify both of them as emissaries of wisdom so that you can explain Jesus's party animal stuff um, still as an emissary of wisdom. If, if I might, just one more comment on that. John seems to be in jail, according to the Q document, and sends his disciples to ask Jesus if he's the one to come. And Jesus says, go tell John what you see. The, the blind receive their sight, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the, the poor have the, the gospel preached to them. And so it's a sequence of things. So that's where the Q document is really intentionally trumping John, that John is not a miracle worker. He's a preacher of repentance. But Jesus is the one who, like Moses, performs signs before Pharaoh. Right. And it has been argued by um, many scholars, like as example, uh, Bart Ehrman, that um, it would have been embarrassing for early Christians to make up a tradition that Jesus, in apparent subservience, would uh, allow himself to be baptized by a figure like John the Baptist. Therefore, the conclusion apparently follows that he that he was, because why would somebody um, claim such a thing? Now, do you think that the author of the the Logoi of Jesus would have been embarrassed by um, by such a an event? Uh, embarrassed by by what? By John baptizing Jesus. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, Matthew certainly is, because Matthew adds to that. Um, you know, John says, um, you know, what are you doing being baptized by me? Uh, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus gives kind of a lame response. Well, it's necessary for the time being. So that Matthew certainly is embarrassed by it. But I don't know that... Um, it has to be an embarrassment at all for the logo of Jesus. Jesus comes to John, who is baptizing for repentance. And Jesus is showing his repentance by coming to be baptized. And then in his baptism, he's vindicated as the Son of God. So th there's no problem with a pre-baptism sinfulness of Jesus. Um, as there would be for Matthew, because Matthew's got, after all, um, a virginal conception and, you know, a holy family story. And that's really unnecessary for the Logoi of Jesus. Actually, it's unnecessary also for Mark. Mark has no infancy story. Jesus learns that he's an adopted son of God, like uh, Octavian was from uh, Julius Caesar. And um, there's no need for sinlessness prior to a baptism. That's fascinating stuff. But so um, there's a problem of understanding the, the title of Son of Man um, within the Gospels as it's used. And different scholars have different thoughts on it. I, I understand one of them um, to, you know, be uh, like a title that comes from like the apocalyptic literature, like Daniel. Um, it, what is your, what are your thoughts on that? And how might uh, the Q plus Papius hypothesis shed some light on that dispute? It's clear. And, um, it's an important dispute 
I'm just astonished that people have not understood how simple the answer is. And here's a place where uh, early interpreters are actually helpful in understanding. The earliest references we have to a historical character being son of man is in the Gospels. If you say that there's a Q document, the Q document is the first time we have the, the word son of man used for a human being. Um, as, a, as a lofty title. But Ezekiel is called the son of man over a hundred times, but without the, the double article. He's called a son of a man. And uh, this is in the Septuagint. But in the New Testament, it always is the son of the man. Hachwios tu anthropo. And the title that Jesus gets at his baptism is Hachwias to Theu, the son of the God. So the devil, after this temptation, the devil takes him up uh, and says, so, okay, big shot. If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus then quotes Deuteronomy. Someone will not live by bread alone. The devil then says, uh, you know, jump off the top of the temple and the angels will catch you. And Jesus then quotes um, Deuteronomy again. Then Jesus is taken up and shown all the kingdoms of the world like Moses has shown the promised land. And so the devil says, I'll give you authority over all these if you worship me. And then what does Jesus do? He quotes Deuteronomy yet again. So he's been, he denies all the prerogatives of being the son of God. When he calls his disciples, he calls them not to follow him because he's the son of God. He's the lowly son of man who has no place to lay his head. He's just been offered authority over all the kingdoms of the world. And he becomes homeless. So the king, Jesus' preferred title even though the reader, the devil, and God, and Jesus all know he's the son of God, is to be the homeless son of man. And for the first half of the logo of Jesus, Jesus refers to himself almost exclusively as the suffering son of man. His disciples are blessed if they suffer for the son of man. That's when he, at the end, he declares that he's going to be the glorified son of man, such as Daniel, and then reveals that he is the son of the father and no one knows the father but the son and to whomever the son reveals him which means it's not moses only the son knows the father and so now he reveals that he actually the son of man is the son of god and the, at some point the son of man like in Daniel, will sit on a throne of his glory, and he will give thrones to the 12 to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So that the failure, in my view, to reconstruct the Logoi of Jesus carefully and precisely is that we haven't seen this conflict between the, tempt the baptism and temptation story, which are interested in Jesus as the Son of God, and Jesus rejects the, his prerogatives and his playing the role of the rejected prophet Ezekiel, where he's the son of man who suffers, his own people will not hear him, and so on. So in terms of dating, do you think that um, the Pauline epistles, at least the authentic ones, um, are prior to the um, Logoi of Jesus? Yes, I do. So it's been argued by scholars that um, certain passages of the Pauline epistles um, demonstrate an understanding of Jesus as a um, pre-existent being. Uh, one example of this that people will often point to is in Philippians 2 verse 7, I think it is, um, where we hear a, a claim of, of Jesus um, like giving up 
uh, I, I don't know exactly what what the language is. I don't remember, but gi- giving up uh, his like eternal qualities to become a servant. Um, do you think that there's a connection between that understanding we find in Paul and the Son of Man um, and tradition, as you just described in the logo of Jesus? Not at all. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. Again, you you show tremendous insight and awareness of New Testament scholarship. But that is not my position at all. According to the Logoi of Jesus, Jesus is a penitent. He learns at his baptism that he's the son of God. There's no infancy narrative. There's no pre-existence. He's, there's not a pre-existent son of man thing. It's that he prefers to identify with humankind in compassion instead of having the personal prerogatives of being king of the world and having a a ready supply of bread from all the stones in the desert. So um, there is, in my view, that has been one of the connection of the preexistent stuff in Paul, which actually I think comes from the Greek world. I don't right. think it comes from, from the Jewish world at all. And so, the Son of Man is a major blunder. Mm, so I was I was actually hoping that you would that you would say that um, because it it prompts um, the the follow up question of chronology. Why then do we find in our earliest source um, such a belief when? our most Jewish source that's earliest, at least hypothesized Jewish source that's earliest, the Logoi of Jesus, doesn't demonstrate that theology. Um, I guess I really am con- uh, confused about the question. Um, let me put it a different way. For me, the theology of, um, at, at the beginning of the Logoi of Jesus, would feel very familiar to anyone who knew the calling of um, the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah. That in the beginning of Ezekiel, the the heavens open, a voice comes from heaven, son of man, I send you to the household of Israel. They are provoking people. They will not listen to you. Even so, be faithful to my word. He's called son of man over and over and over again. Or Isaiah is called um, as a human being now to be an emissary. Even the idea of Jesus's glorification can be understood something like um, the um, uh, Elijah uh, coming mm-hmm. back and the ascension of Elijah and coming back. And then later traditions, or actually post biblical traditions, but by the time of the New Testament, you see Josephus, Moses also has an ascension and is it going to come back? So I think the Christology, what we call the Christology of Q, that is a heavily theologized Jesus, is much more native to Judaism and to the biblical tradition than anything you find in Paul. Well, that's overstated because Paul also has um, a heavy Jewish influence, of course. But the um, I think the Christ, as I understand it, the the exalted view of Jesus that you have in the logo of Jesus at first would be very familiar to a Jewish reader. What is different, though, is that Jesus replaces Moses as the authoritative speaker of God and no one knows the Father but the Son, and to whomever the Son reveals him. God says to Moses in, in, the, in Exodus, uh, I know you more than anybody in the world. And when Moses says, I want to see your face, God says, nothing doing. So that there's an intimacy between Jesus and God, which goes far beyond anything that you find in, in uh, Mosaic traditions in Judaism. Hmm. So I, th- I think to get to to what I was trying to ask, um, if we if we understand both of these uh, sort of theological 
traditions or conceptions or developments within the Christian movement, um, if we understand them as being divergent, and then we under and then we ask the question, uh, or can we answer the question, which of them developed first? Um, I think that is a tricky question. I think um, the, an easier question is to see how those two traditions get merged in Mark and Matthew. Yeah. So there you have the melding. Um, it, one might call the creation of a theological hybrid where you have both the Son of Man tradition and um, the, the, kind of an exalted Jesus as Greek hero going on in those texts. I think what one, so I, th in terms of the witnesses we have, one would have to say that the tradition of Jesus as being um, somehow pre-existent and th that kind of swoop theory of an incarnation, as they call it sometimes, um, is it's earlier in Paul. Paul's earlier than the, the, the Logo of Jesus. I, I would suspect, though, the Logo of Jesus is more insulated from Greek influence and reflects um, a more primitive Palestinian Jewish admiration for Jesus that then becomes um, a source for the other Gospels. Do you think that, um, I, I'm a little conscious of the time, but if, if you do have time for um, some more, uh, just let me know if you don't. <laughs> no, no, I'm all right for now. Um, Paul claims to have met, communicated, at times disputed with uh, the pillars and in particular uh, Peter. Do you think that Peter shared Paul's uh, theology or Christology? Um, I have no idea. But what I would say is that that reference that we have in Galatians is extremely important that um, when Peter and Paul got together, my guess is they didn't discuss golf or, or sailing, <laughs> that they just, so that there must have been a sharing of uh, traditions and teachings and so on. And occasionally we find overlapping content between what one would call a Palestinian, more Torah observant tradition, such as we find with Peter and the logo of Jesus, and uh, a more Gentile driven, um, mission with Paul. So I don't know that we're in a position, I'm certainly not in a position to say that Peter would have agreed with Paul's theology, but I also think it's important to recognize that new studies I think are persuasive that Paul is every bit as much a Jew as Josephus is. And um, that the big issue for him is circumcision and opening to Gentiles but it's in order to bring them into the Jewish heritage. So I wouldn't want to, to have too heavy a cleaver to divide Paul and Peter. Right. And uh, X, at least for, um, for the later church, certainly did a good cho job of making sure those two weren't cleaved. <laughs> in fact, Peter is the one who has the beginning of the Gentile mission, and Paul's the one who's going to synagogues and getting in trouble. Yeah, I always find it amusing, uh, the descriptions of, of Peter's visions. Uh, and I'm always uh, thinking back to Matthew and the Great Commission, and it, it, it definitely strikes some confusion in, in me how Christians can reconcile that. <laughs> uh, well, um, and Matthew is a good example of it because Matthew inherits uh, the Q document that says, don't go to the Gentiles, don't cast your pearls before swine. Hmm. So, yeah. hey, this has been fun, guys. I, uh, I got a whole bunch of questions here. Some of them are from the chat. Some of them are my own. I won't tell you which is which. Um, but <laughs> I, I want to break this down very simply. So, Dennis, you believe that there was this real guy named Jesus 
He was born from a real woman. He had real skin. He had this message. And we get recordings of this message first from a guy named Paul. Then from some document that we're calling Q or the Logoi, the sayings of this Jesus guy. Uh -huh. And then the author of the Gospel of Mark. And then after that, the author of Matthew. And after that, Papias. No, uh, uh, Matthew then, and then Papias. Then, then, then Papias. And then after that, Luke and John. Yeah. Okay, so that's the order. And you said that the writings of Paul come first before Q. Probably. Okay. And I, I had a question similar to Cam's because it seems like, uh, I'm assuming you, you reject half of uh, what's attributed to Paul like most scholars do? Yes. Okay. It seems like this Paul guy doesn't talk about Jesus' mother his, or his father or his brothers that much. Uh, his ministry, his miracles, his day-to-day -day life, that he was a carpenter, all these things. Why is there such a big shift between Paul that was written earlier and the Q document that goes more into details about this guy's life, and yet there's so much imitation from the Old Testament, like you said, from Deuteronomy, and the, he's representing the, the more compassionate Moses. I, I'm a little confused how... It, it seems like the evidence would sway you to believe that this Jesus guy wasn't fleshy. Oh, I understand. You know, um, am I talking to Richard Carrier here? Um, <laughs> here's how I would put it. First of all, we have to assume, I think, that the Christian movement was not homogeneous and it was not linear and that certain conditions applied in the Levant, where we have Mark, let's say, in Matthew and Q, and the Pauline mission that is more in Europe. So that um, the, it's not even clear how much commerce there is um, between these groups. So I wouldn't want to put together a, a genetic model of the growth of the Christian movement by saying which came earlier, or which came later. It's similar to my answer to Cam's question, that I think these are moving in different directions. Paul is more interested clearly in the fact of Jesus as a, 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 a symbol of God's grace to humankind as the crucified one than he has, is in Jesus's teachings. In fact, many of the teachings that are similar to the Logoi of Jesus, where they're ascribed to Jesus, appear in Paul with an ascription. He just puts these things in. It's better to give than to receive. Or, Well, that's not actually one of them. But um, I wouldn't want to see them as... Um, There's a teaching on marriage, marriage, I think. The other is that I don't think if you're concerned about the crucifixion, that there's much reason to bring up Jesus's family or whether he was from Nazareth or what his disputes are about the Torah. So I just think the agendas are so different that I wouldn't be surprised that you have that information absent in Paul at all. Right. So the idea there is that um, while it is true that there is largely an absence of, um, you know, identification of with of Jesus with historical datum that we, you know, get from the Gospels. Um, this is what we would expect from an author who has the particular agenda he has, the particular theological or Christological beliefs he has, and yeah. the primary focus of why he's writing to his audience. Yeah, that's a, that's a better way of saying it than I did, yeah. And so do you, th here's a question, um, and maybe I'm, I'm getting ahead of Doug, but so we find in um, the Gospel of Mark our first at least extant uh, reference to Jesus being crucified um, under Pilate. Do you think that dating-wise, like with, like, so we're 
taking for granted that Jesus was a historical figure. We're taking for granted that he was um, that he was crucified, um, perhaps even by the Romans. Um, do we think that it was Pilate who did this? Well, first of all, if it's a crucifixion, it is by Romans. So it, it but the Q document already knows that Jesus was crucified. If you will follow me, you pick up your cross and follow me. And the author drops lots of hints that Jesus's followers, like he, are going to be brought before um, uh, tribunals and they're going to be tested by those who have power to kill the body, but not the soul, he'll add. He encourages them to, to um, perseverance. They're laying up treasures in heaven after all. So that there's this will... Jesus was sacrificial and that John was placed in prison is an anticipation of probably what's going to happen to Jesus. So the author is concerned about the death of Jesus, but instead of making faith in the death of Jesus, the requirement for salvation as it is for Paul, it simply is the tragic exit stage left of the Son of Man, who's now going to be the glorified Son of Man, and is going to come back to earth and kick butt against his, his enemies. So um, I, I, I guess that's the best I could do for that question right now. Right. So in your uh, reconstruction of the logo of Jesus, um, the author doesn't identify his crucifixion as occurring under Pilate? No, there's no reason. There's All we would know is that the, the cross is a Roman form of uh, punishment. That's all we know. Right. And that given, I have a pretty high view of Mark's creativity. And I consider the identification of Jesus with Pilate as having originated with Mark, whether or not it's historical. Um, given Mark's like general um, unreliability as a historical document, can we trust that Jesus was crucified under Pilate? I don't see a way. I don't see a sufficient reason to doubt it. Let me put it that way. Right. Okay, cool. I There were some questions uh, in the chat um, about your personal stance on things, and I don't know if you're willing to answer them. Sure. Um, but do you believe in God? In no. God? Okay. No. Uh, so that means you don't believe that this Jesus figure was at all, at all divine. Um, you view him then as a great moral teacher, basically. Um, that sounds too reductionistic to me, but um, I'll accept it for now. <laughs> I guess you could add words to it. Like um, when you think of Jesus, what are the the words that pop into your mind? Like what? who is Jesus to you personally? Um, I think Jesus was a daring redefinition of cultural norms for his community that was interested in lowering the bar of um, appropriate conduct from a very high legalistic, burdened understanding of Jewish law into something that was more flexible. It was open to Gentiles. Um, even the story of the um, Jesus forgiving the sinful woman that appears in some texts of the Gospel of John, I attribute to the Q document. Now, that, whether that reflects Jesus or not, I'm not sure, but the, the witness of that text is that Jesus is involved dangerously in conflicts about um, exorcisms and healings and so on, and is presented as acting compassionately because um, he is emiss an emissary as the son of God who preaches the kingdom of God. And so I would say that, uh, yes, you could say he's a teacher, but I think it's not a teacher in the sense that we think of a university professor. It's someone who is risking life as a social radical, not unlike Martin King. 
who has a different vision about what that movement can mean, what it means to reach out to others. Uh, and so he's, um, I would call him more of a social radical with the teaching of compassion, an attempt to humanize Jewish law and to uh, relax its norms. Again, I go back to this business about the criticism in the law glory of Jesus that Jesus is making to the the uh, nomikoi, those who are interpreters of the law. You put burdens on people and you don't lift your finger to help them. And that I think is uh, how I would understand Jesus as a as, as a teaching social reformer who um, uh, risked facing the establishment and their high expectations of their own. Um, uh, righteousness and uh, chosenness. C.S. Lewis said that vicarious redemption is uh, worse than the evil pits of hell. Um, do you think Jesus viewed himself as someone who would die for the sins of the world? No. Yeah, I, I kind of guess that would be the answer, but I just wanted to make that clear for people listening. Um, Jesus is smarter than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, Cam, if you have a question. Well, what, what I, I, I just comment on that. I, if, if it is the case that Jesus was that person, was that social reformer, um, and, you know, took apart and, you know, influenced a generation to take apart what was um, a, you know, a form of social structure that disadvantaged people, then I think he did do a good job. <laughs> I think he did do a good thing. Um, it makes sense why you have a high view of it. Yeah. No, I'm, um, I, I wish I were that noble. One person in chat asks, uh, why is the Gospel of Mark attributed to Mark and not Peter? Uh, that's very interesting. And I think it's related to Papias again. Already a tradition that Papias receives, says one gospel is written by Matthew. Matthew appears in lists of Jesus's followers. It's a Hebrew name, and the tradition was that he composed in Hebrew. Marcus is a Latin name. Marcus does not appear in any gospel as a follower of Jesus, so he clearly is secondary. And I think these names are given to the gospels later to establish the priority that they had for Matthew over Mark. So Mark has a Latin name. It's derived from Peter, so it still has good tradition. But <clears throat> Matthew is the more authentic gospel. It's the one that preserves, although for Papias, uh, problematically. And that's why Papias wants to restore the Matthew um, order. But I think uh, the your caller is is right <clears throat> that you'd think by all rights it would be called the Gospel of Peter, but uh, Peter is preaching in Hebrew. Uh, Mark translates it. The word is word means translate into Greek, and so uh, you have a Latin name to distance the Gospel from the same credulity that the tradition gave to Matthew. So Papias basically favored Matthew and just called that Gospel of Mark Mark to kind of put it down a little bit? Is that? Well, he's already receiving this as a tradition from John the Elder, so you can't blame Papias for it. Okay. Uh, I think the issue would be that the, the Jahanine tradition, as, as John the Elder would represent it, found itself favoring the Matthaean version more than the Markan version, in part maybe because it was more clearly Jewish and contained more teaching. Do you think that there was something in Papias's exposition that wasn't liked by later Christians? I think most of it wasn't liked by later Christians. Eusebius, in talking about him, says you can tell he's a man of very little intelligence. He says that right up front. Well, he was a man of great intelligence, as a matter of fact. Mm. I, if I were to, and I say this in two shipwreck gospels, I think one reason that, that the, uh, expo the exposition of Logia about the Lord didn't survive is that it compared 
the gospels that became authentic to the church with this document that no longer existed. So, you know, if you're comparing these texts and you've got one text that no longer exists and it's not a part of the church's um, the canon, you get rid of it. So absolutely every passage where we have uh, the preservation of the Logoi of Jesus related to a gospel content, it's tagged on to a statement that it's also in the gospels so uh, that are received by the church. So it's the process of canonicity of the gospels that excludes the Logoi of Jesus that made Papias almost incomprehensible. Do you do you hope for a day where, in some cave somewhere, in some in some pot, we'll find preserved the logo of Jesus? <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've cleaned my garage looking. <laughs> yeah, um, of course I have hopes, um, but uh, they're not realistic ones. I'm. This is a bit of a dangerous question. Maybe I don't know, but is there anything in the Gospels that you think Jesus actually said? Sure. Can you give me a few examples? Well, he would have said that in an Aramaic, most likely. Um, I think things like um, the one who would save his life will lose it. The one who loses his life will save it. Um, a lot of wisdom sayings. Um, so let's see, um, love your enemies. I wouldn't be surprised at the golden rule as a, a variation on Lex Talionis, I think it could qualify. No, I'm not going to get caught into having a red letter version of my reconstruction of Q, but, um, I, instead of talking about the Ipsissima Wereba, the exact words of Jesus, I would rather talk about an Ipsissima Wux, the authentic voice of Jesus. And if if I'm allowed that freedom, I would say, yes, I think there's a lot of content in the Gospels that reflects a moral vision related to the kingdom of God that they attribute to Jesus, and I wouldn't be surprised that it did come from him. So with your example of like the golden rule, if we put it on a scale of one to 10, 10 to be 10 being the closest to the Ipsissima Vox um, and one being just absolutely made up, where, where would you put that? Just a guess. Five. Five. Okay. Now I am the bread of life. Where would you put that? Tell me what the scale is from authentic. One, what, one is really inauthentic and 10 is really authentic. I would give that an 11. So the, the, bread of life. the bread of life is authentic. No, no. The bread of I thought that's what oh, it was. Other way around. Yeah. The other way around. No, it's, it's, uh, it, it, there's no chance that comes from Jesus. So do you think that that's entirely the, the voice of the Johannine community? Yes. Um, and it's under the influence of Dionysian religion, in my view. Maybe that's a, a third interview we can do on your <laughs> your, your latest book. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, it's been uh, close to an hour and a half, a little under, but uh, I just had one last question, and it's uh, from a, a big fan of Cam's. Um, he asks, can you get Cam into Harvard in New Testament studies? I'll do my best. <laughs> I'll do my best. Yeah, I have no undergraduate degree, so that might be difficult. <laughs> well, I returned my undergraduate degree, and I still got in. So I, yeah, I returned it out of protest to Bob Jones' attitude toward racism. Oh, wow. Good on you, Dennis. So I, you literally I returned it? I put it in an envelope and returned it and said, I'm too embarrassed to hold this degree and I'm returning it in protest. I don't know if you're familiar with the Sojourner magazine. I helped start the Sojourner magazine as a, as a part, and when I was an evangelical Christian. Yeah. Wow. I'm a different kind of Christian now, but I'm, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Well, that was intense. Um, 
uh, like I, I was just sitting back and listening and what, reading the comments, and it took all my brain power just to keep up with you and Cam. Um, but I think I understood most of it, and it was really educational. And I hope that, um, you know, there's, it seems like this is such great information, but so few people, like the atheists don't really care about it because they, hey, they just don't believe. And, and then the fundamentalists, they don't care about it because, hey, the Bible's true, and that's all I need to know. And so you got these, this, like these liberal Christians and maybe some other people who just love literary, ancient literary uh, texts that who are really uh, interested in this sort of thing and I think this is very very valuable uh, for them uh, well thank you you guys are making it more public good for you yes and um, I, I thank just, you for your time I was just going to add that uh, thank you to everyone who also watched this uh, this live stream and um, and maybe who knows sometime in the future we will have part two, part three <laughs> Thanks again. See y'all. Au revoir. See you.